Catherine, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, very nice introduction. And thank you very much, Henrietta, wherever you are, <laughs> for inviting me. Um, it's a real pleasure um, to be here. Um, so, uh, as, as uh, David said, I'm, I'm very interested in, um, in uh, populisms. Uh, I'm interested in populism as an ideological form. Um, and um, therefore, I'm also interested in that which populism seeks to sap most effectively, which are um, essentially the institutions um, that it considers uh, illegitimate and under which um, it grows. So my interest in populism to begin with was very much um, from the point of view of somebody um, who is, a, is an institutionalist. Um, and um, I think this will be apparent <clears throat> in, in my talk. So I was asked to give a provocation. And the problem with, with provocations is that um, you know, it really depends where you are, you know, <laughs> whether or not you're actually going to come across as provocative. Um, so let, let's just see if any of this is provocative. If it isn't provocative, hopefully at least it'll be, um, it'll be interesting and, and, worth, and worth some discussion. Um, my starting point, um, given that this, the, this is the Institute for Global Prosperity, is um, a set of discussions that I've ha been having with, um, with Henrietta, but also in various ways with, um, with David here, um, on institutions and on the link between in institutions and prosperity. And so the starting point really is the idea that there is no prosperity or no hope of prosperity without actually institutional prosperity. So what I want to look at today is you know, um, whether or not our institutions are prosperous. Um, what is a prosperous set of institutions? What could it look like? Um, and, you know, and then a, a few hints about um, the work that we've been doing at CounterPoint, but that I've also done in the past about how you might actually um, uh, recreate, um, rebuild um, prosperous institutions. So <clears throat> I think the, you saw the title of, of, of my talk, which was in, um, invaluable at first and deadly afterwards, which is um, drawn from a, a Walter uh, Badgett quote, the whole history of civilization is strewn with creeds and institutions which were invaluable at first and deadly afterwards. And I think that this is, this is a particularly apt place to start because it captures, it seems to me, um, both the, the kind of the momentary, quite sort of situational nitty gritty in which we find ourselves, whether it's actually um, the, um, the elections in Greece um, and you know, the crumbling of the, the Greek party system under, under the weight of a number of things, but under the electoral uh, success of Syriza, or whether we're looking at Charlie Hebdo, or whether we're looking at a more um, concentrated uh, phenomenon like the Front National in France or UKIP here in the UK. Um, one of the things that, that I think um, Badgett captures incredibly well and which we would do well to really to keep in mind and which I always remind essentially decision makers and policy makers, politicians to keep in mind is that actually institutions, um, institutions have cycles. Um, and what may be useful at one point can become, as Badgett says, deadly afterwards. So one of the things that I want to look at, um, one of the things I want to look at today um, is, is those in part, not only, but in part, what are those signs um, of death that we can, that we can detect? Um, you know, and, I, and I think a, a number of people have spoken about um, zombie institutions, you know, institutions that sort of, you know, carry forth, um, but somehow um, are, you know, are actually devoid of current life, real life, impetus, momentum, enthusiasm, legitimacy, you name it. So they are, they are simply uh, moving forward, um, but are already dead. So one of the things that I want to start with is, you know, before looking at how we reclaim or refashion and rebuild these institutions, what are the what are the symptoms? And I, I'm I'm starting here with a with just a, 
with populism itself, because one of the problems about talking about populism is that people think that all we're ever talking about is the far right and, um, or the extreme right. Um, and, um, and then when uh, often there is a jumping in of people saying, no, 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 you know, you, you can have populism of the left, which is absolutely true, we often go down this interesting debate where either uh, because it's populism of the left, we like it. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I, that, that's slightly problematic as far as I'm concerned. I'm on the record as saying that, you know, there is no such thing as good populism. <laughs> it is always problematic. But also, it's become a term that has tended to mean, you know, nothing and everything. So, you know, and I think, uh, I think for example, the accusations of populism against uh, uh, Ed Miliband when he made his... Um, his uh, um, declarations and his announcements on energy policy, for example, he was accused of being a populist. Um, Syriza is often depicted as, as, as being populist. I'm not convinced that this is you know, really the right label uh, for, for these gestures. And there's a confusion between popular and populist, which I think really does us no service. Um, we live <clears throat> in, uh, in, in these cases we're dealing with uh, essentially liberal democracies uh, with majoritarian politics um, and therefore in order to win you need to be popular. That doesn't necessarily make you a populist. Uh, that makes you somebody who plays by the rules of the, of the game. So the kind of populism that I want to look at and which you know serves to to talk about um, our institutional renewal and, and prosperous institutions is something that isn't necessarily that is expressed through political movements and, and perhaps through political leaders but isn't necessarily uh, entirely captured by these political movements and political leaders I would go further than that and I would actually say that you know what we are witnessing at the beginning of the 21st century is actually the coming of age of populism as an ideology um, up until now, it was always thought of you know, as a minor component of other ideologies, for example, a minor component of fascism, or even a minor component of certain forms of, of liberal democracy. And authors like Margaret Canavan, for example, have done a lot of, uh, did a lot of good work, um, incredibly valuable work that I don't think we pay enough attention to on the relationship between uh, populism and other ideological forms, but also populism and democracy. There is a symbiotic relationship between the two. And it is that symbiotic relationship that actually makes it so hard for us to come to terms with what populism is and what m dangers it might actually uh, represent. Um, in, the, in the way that we're using it here, um, what we're saying is, uh, what I'm saying is that actually populism, given a certain set of circumstances and a certain set of contributing factors, is actually um, on the way to becoming a, a much more full-fledged ideology rather than only parasitic on certain other forms. And, you know, one of the provocations here is to say, you know, is the 21st century the century, uh, the century of populism? You know, what, you know, the question is, what's changed that makes this um, ideological form perhaps, you know, more able to evolve, more powerful now than it used to be in the past? The interesting thing for us, in the, uh, connected to institutions here, is that um, populism in the way that many have conceived of it and the way that we use it is that it is both, populism is, is essentially conceived of as an ideological form and a political form um, that essentially piggybacks on a conception of institutional betrayal. Right? It, it, is, it is not just the fact that the institutions are not delivering what a segment of society might not want. It is not just the fact that they might be disappointing in the way that they, that they behave. It is the fact that actually the, those who are in these institutions are actively engaged in duping and betraying um, the, the voters and the members of the public. Um, that in a sense, they have usurped their power by uh, by claiming to represent either left-wing politics or right-wing politics, but actually they're all in it 
uh, together, that it is uh, a, um, that the distinctions which uh, political leaders of any camp continue to harp upon are actually manufactured distinctions, and that they're manufactured for the purpose of duping the electorate and duping members of the public. Um, and that therefore the leaders in place are not illegitimate in the sense that they are not delivering what they promised, although that might be a part of it, but they are actually illegitimate because they are pretending to behave in a national interest and in fact are not, they're behaving in their own interests as, um, as, a member of the, as members of the elite and as members of the establishment. The accusation being that they have a lot more in common together, uh, with each other rather, um, than they have with the people they claim to be representing. And that, you know, is very well uh, placed in evidence by somebody like Marine Le Pen, who uh, you know amalgamates the, the the names of the two main French parties into you know UMP on the one hand, PS on the other, and she just calls them the UMPS. Um, and of course, you know um, the kinds of you know the 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 sort of the heartbreaking paradox in this is that we live in a world where possibly. Um, uh, different political factions need somehow to be able to find some sort of uh, terrain of compromise, some sort of terrain of negotiation um, in order to keep uh, a dialogue uh, going. Um, but that negotiation, that capacity to compromise or that capacity to enter into a dialogue across left and right, for instance, is actually seen as proof of, of the collusion. So there is, a, there is a deep sense of institutional betraying. And of course, uh, that sense of institutional betrayal creates the forces that undermine um, these, these, in, these institutions. The, the harder political parties and political leaders fight against this, um, the more they seem in it for themselves, the harder they are pressed on concrete solutions the more concrete the solutions, the more they're accused of being technocrats. Um, and yet, when they don't deliver a technocratic solution, they're then accused to be um, either uh, incompetent or illegitimate. So it's, a, it's an extremely um, difficult and um, and as I said, I know it sounds like a bit of an emotive term, but it's actually democratically heartbreaking, a democratically heartbreaking um, situation. So. <clears throat> I don't, we, I don't want to spend too much more time on this, but the interesting thing here is, you know, why is this such a, a you know, why such a problem now? And of course, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a set of intertwining contributing factors, you know, whether it's uh, essentially uh, the, the rise of digital expression that actually creates and on one level, um, a very powerful public, on the other hand, raises expectations massively um, in a way that, to some extent, fuels permanent disappointment and permanent disenfranchisement. You know, that's the you know the the, the flip side of the coin in terms of digital access. Um, you know, the questioning of any kind of expertise, be it political or technical um, or scientific, um, which on the one hand, of course, is healthy. Um, you know, the retreat of deference is not something that we should uh, that we should mourn. On the other hand, it also creates fragmentation, a sense of radical uncertainty, um, as um, as David often uh, terms it, um, and also a sense of um, both on the part of the electorate not you know, having its preferences um, constantly reconfigured and redefined, and obviously for decision makers, the sense in which the preferences, uh, motivations, and behaviors of uh, members of the public are increasingly difficult um, to, to understand. And so there's a, there's a sense of a, a losing battle, which, um, you know, many of the projects that we engage in at CounterPoint um, essentially uh, attempt to to, to disabuse pol uh, policymakers of the fact that this is just a bunch of irrational citizens that actually, you know, these contradictions, you know, have a um, have um, a reasonable uh, and complex set uh, of causes. So <clears throat> the reason I've 
outlined this, uh, these issues on, um, outlined some things on, on populism, but also on the contributing factors, is that I think that to some extent, you know, we feel in political terms and in policymaking terms that we're at the heart of a perfect storm and that the institutions um, that are supposed to help us uh, make decisions in a more routine and appeased way are actually um, under, under fire and are actually crumbling before um, our very eyes. And I think that, you know, one of the things that the Charlie Hebdo uh, case um, really, uh, really, really points to um, is an instance of a perfect storm that should be seized, you know, let no good crisis go to waste, that should be seized to redesign a set of political institutions that the, post, that the Charlie Hebdo and the post-Charlie Hebdo period is showing us to be fundamentally damaged um, and in some ways, uh, not to speak like a populist, fundamentally illegitimate for a, for a, a variety of, um, of citizens in France. Um, government action post-Charlie Hebdo has been almost of an American uh, of an American ilk, um, it's basically, you know, raised its head and said, these truths we hold to be self-evident, um, which is a massive mistake because obviously everything that's happened around Charlie Hebdo shows that these truths may be important um, and they may be precious, uh, but they are not held as truths uh, by vast swathes of the French population who didn't actually turn up to march. Um, so <clears throat> I think that one of the things that we, we want to, um, you know, we want to do in our work on the Charlie Hebdo case is very much look at it as a case of um, potentially uh, of redesign of institutions, re-evaluation of institutions, and in some ways addressing that idea of how can we make these institutions prosperous um, again. And, and here, I'm on, a, I'm on a badget kick at the moment. I've, I've rediscovered uh, Walter Badgett, and then um, <clears throat> I've rediscovered how um, insightful um, he was over 100 years ago. And, and I think it's really, uh, it's so, the, the way that he puts it is, is, is very interesting, because first of all, it's, it's so contemporary. Um, and yet, this idea that, um, so changing is the world, so fluctuating are its needs, um, so apt to lose inward force, though retaining outward strength. Again, it's back to that idea of the zombie, uh, the zombie institution. This creates, in a sense, an imperative that we not just venerate the existing and the old, but actually um, that we look at emerging institutions and supporting emerging institutions that, as he says, are apt for the modern world, instinct with its spirit and fitting closely to its life. Um, I think it's an incredibly, um, uh, not just insightful, but you know, an, an incredibly elegant capturing of the situation in which we find ourselves in. The institutions we are in often do not fit closely to our lives. Um, so, I think that one of the things that I was asking myself, and I welcome, you know, discussion on this, because it's a beginning of a research project for us, but it's also, I think, a research question that we're going to keep um, uh, thrashing through with Henrietta and, and, and hopefully in partnership with the Institute, is, you know, what, how do we know if an institution is prosperous, right? What, you know what are the what are the leads in a sense that we need to uh, that we need to to have in order to know whether an institution is prosperous and I think that you know the starting points which are um, obviously you know up for debate but also up for adding to um, the starting point is the idea that prosperity um, in in a sense in contrast to simply wealth. Prosperity is something that needs to be shared, which is precisely what institutions do. That in prosperity, you, you are not prosperous alone. You are prosperous with others because prosperity is in part defined by well-being. 
and well-being is in great part, um, it's, it's in part individual, but it's also collective and social. So prosperous institutions um, are institutions that bring us together in uh, a shared endeavor, in a reinvented shared um, endeavor. It's also prosperous institutions, um, but prosperity points to a trajectory. Um, there is no sense, there may be a sense that you may be prosperous now, but not prosperous in 30 years' time. But there's very little sense in which you might be prosperous now, but not prosperous tomorrow. Pro prosperity um, creates the sense in which you are on a trajectory um, that is a trajectory of shared well-being, that is a trajectory um, of, um, of, of, that is socially, not just individually, but also socially negotiated and shared. Um, and I think it points to, um, you know, one of the things that that um, Klaus Sulfer, who's um, I think possibly um, most eloquent after Badgett, contemporary um, uh, analyst of institutions, um, Klaus Sulfer says that you know what institutions do is that they create the necessary democratic illusion, right? And rather than just sort of say, well, you know. Institutions build trust, which in, in a sense is you know, pro probably true, but opens yet another can of worms. I think that you know, one of the things he says is that actually we imagine that we have something in common with perfect strangers. And it's obviously worth, um, worth uh, repeating. That creation of that something in common with perfect strangers goes back to the idea that prosperity is something shared, something that you can um, talk to each other about and share in, share in the success. There is an element in prosperity that is about sharing in the success of something as opposed to, um, strictly speaking, uh, wealth. So <clears throat> what do we, the way that we've often um, gone about talk, talking about these issues is, you know, is essentially saying, right, this, these institutions need to be co-designed and co-produced. Um, but obviously, and I say this as somebody who did an awful lot of co-designing and co-production at Demos, um, co-designing and co-production, if it's done only um, to make small numbers of people feel good, will never lead to institutional redesign. And it needs to start from the premise that our current institutions need to be, whether it's an electoral system or whether it be a um, system of redistributive welfare, um, need to be redesigned need, um, in light of an acknowledgement of failure, which is not often something that gets put forward. What often gets put forward is, doesn't it feel good to do stuff together and learn stuff together? That's, that's great, but frankly, that's slightly patronizing. And the people that we've, we've worked with um, are really tired of being asked what kind of color they'd like the stairwell repainted you know, in, their, in their block um, as a proxy or as a substitute for an actual voice in being involved in the way in which those institutions that structure both their preferences but also their rights and their entitlements are actually being um, are actually being delivered. Um, so I think that where we've got to, and we're we're testing this. We're testing this in terms of redesigning schools, not the redesign that I was involved with, you know, years ago in sort of building schools for the future. Oh, wouldn't it be great if the kids drew us something, something? Um, but actually, uh, much more um, involved, uh, much more large scale inputs into the redesign of a number of institutions. And the way that this connects to Charlie Hebdo is what we're trying to do, for example, with the French prime minister at the moment, who has gone out and basically said, you know, it's secularism or nothing. And we're sort of saying, well, 
Why? Well, because it's an institution of the French Republic, right? Don't you think it needs to be given new lease of life by a kind of questioning and renegotiating? Well, no, because it's self-evident. So we feel a bit like Sisyphus at this point, but you know, I think we're gonna we're gonna get there. Um, and it, you know, and we can talk more about co-design and co-production of institutions um, now. Sorry, I've, I've gone over time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think that's really interesting. There are lots of things that I could say, but I don't want to distract from what you might want to ask Catherine more about. Hi. Um, can I was just um, looking for a bit of clarification on your last point about co design. Mm -hmm. um, did you say that um, like small initiatives to get people involved, but on a very low level with very little impact? is meaningless and that we have to start from failure. But then if people are able to be involved in a much greater sense mm -hmm. um, and have a true institutional effect, that that's a positive thing. But it's, and it's possible. I think that... Um, no, of course, it's, it's not meaningless to involve people even in, in small elements of transformation. But I think that they've, these small elements of very local transformations um, have often been used as substitutes for bigger elements of transformation um, in, in people's lives. But I also think that they've often been um, uh, begun, depicted, designed, um, you know, under the idea that this was just a first step, right? A first step to empowerment, a first step to really, to really being involved, a first step um, to making a difference and tailoring, if you like, you know, uh, small moments of democratic interaction to, to your needs, um, but connected to something bigger. And where I am, where I am skeptical is so far our success in actually connecting this to something bigger. The problem with that is that once something bigger has been promised um, and it doesn't follow and things don't change beyond your local park, for example, then actually I think it creates real, it can create real resentment and, and disappointment. So that, that's all I mean, yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I was just reflecting on your what you're saying about if we're trying to um, co-design and redesign institutions, the, the impression I got from your presentation is that um, institutions um, can thrive for a certain time and then they get out of step with change mm. um, and no longer. Um, reflect very well the context in which they are. Mm. Um, which you know, I'm just reflecting on my my experience in um, a British institution for eight years as a senior manager, and <coughs> it's very culturally important within the institution to promote sort of individual reflexivity. So individual staff members how to reflect on their year and identify the strengths and weaknesses and their failures. And this was all part of the supervision structure of management and the staff supervision sessions. And it was really important that we addressed on an individual level all our strengths and weaknesses and where we've gone wrong in the year and what do our learning needs, how do we adapt in, our, in the work we're doing to the changing context. But when it came to the institution as a whole, there was no structure and no culture of institutional reflexivity. Mm -hmm. So if, if you try and challenge the institution, i.e. the board and the senior managers, say, look, we, we're going horribly wrong as an institution in this issue. We need to stop and think, and we need to really face up to the changing world. Um, there's, there's no structure, there's no openness. Um, it's almost felt as a threat. And I don't know if that's... Because I think that aspect of reflexivity, which is always such an individual mm. and academic tool, you know, you do your research and you, you 
you're reflecting about your role in the research process. Mm -hmm. But institutions don't seem to want an institutional version of this. But it seems like that, mm. that might be a part of... Of the new design. Of the new design and the, the well, Madonna would say, the reinvention <laughs> of an institution. Um, looking outwards and seeing um, what the context is and what the changes are. Like the French government, if it looked outwards, it would realise that mm. many of its citizens are very religious. Yeah. So how do you be a secular state <clears throat> without denying the religiosity of all your citizens. Mm. You can't expect all your citizens to be secular too. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's something you've, you've explored, that kind of institutional reflexivity. Well, I mean, I think one of the, one of the things that what you say brings up um, among the many is that I mean, obviously, institutions are paradoxical in that, on the one hand, we rely on them to create routine. Um, that's what, that, that is what we want from institutions, so that we don't all have to be implicated in reinventing the wheel all the time. And you know, we're happy to delegate for somebody, you know, to, for others to essentially cater to an agreed set of preferences and deliverables and, and so on. But at the same time, that routine requires um, almost a monoculturality inside the institution. It requires that people know exactly what they're doing, and it requires repetition, which in and of itself, to some extent, you know, precludes the kind of creativity and refle reflexivity that we would wish th for them to have. Now, I think that one of the, the uh, issues that that we fare, we face more acutely, or that institutions face more acutely now, is the fact that that routine up until now was preserved in part by the fact that they were largely impermeable. Um, we are, I think, we're, uh, no institution at this point can afford to be impermeable. And even should it wish to be, um, the fact is that, it is that it is not, that communications at, at, um, at the moment make it permeable to the exterior world. In some ways, I think that that creates you know, a pressure to adapt, which is good. On the other hand, I think that you know, that is, as you say, lived as a threat at various levels. And therefore, you know, there's an awful lot of battening down the hatches to just you know, deliver what we said we would deliver rather than get distracted off the path by you know, all these people telling us on our you know, uh, home office Facebook page that they wished we did things you know, slightly, slightly differently. So I think that you know, you're right that, that a part of the new design has to be about how we harness new forms of communication to make institutions more reflexive. Because actually, you know, even though partly these, these forms of communication are responsible, I think, for the kinds of for the precipitation of, a, of these crises, they also obviously hold the solution. They are, they, and right now, I don't think that most institutions are organizations, because often the, the, the distinction is slight. I don't think most institutions and organizations have yet really cracked beyond having a Facebook page and, oh my God, we better, we better look like we're with it, so let's, you know, let's have a Twitter account or, or something. I don't think it's gone really beyond the cosmetic in terms of using them as tools, but if, but but on the outside, I think you know um, the instrumentalization of these means has been much more effective. So, I mean, I think what, what the central point here is that uh, is about feedback mechanisms, and, and you're seeing sort of hope in these digital type developments in providing feed, feedback mm. um, in dealing. Because you're never going to change anything unless there's pressure to change. No. People dreaming up what a possible society to look up has, has to start mm. from what you wrote down there as, um, as I read it in your slide, how to capture the concerns and aspirations mm -hmm. of people. Mm. I mean, that's and where they are impacting on institutions and producing negative uh, experiences. But the pro there's one problem here you might like to elaborate on, which is mm. to do with expertise. Yeah. <clears throat> because from my psychological <coughs> point of view, 
expertise and quite a lot of what is happening around this populism is a very interesting problem because the psychological state of recognizing that Mr. X knows more than me is actually a very difficult state to achieve in, except by deference. Yeah, exactly. You can do it by deference, and that's just, you can, but actually, authority by deference is, is totally useless and open to all kinds of difficulties. So, the very interesting point is that the attack on the expert, mm. which in psychoanalytic terms mm. is perhaps the good old Oedipus complex, which most of you may not know or laugh at, but is the key to this particular problem, mm. that there are really serious problems in accepting that some people know more than others, and or determining what are the criteria for that. Yeah. Because that then gets into the idea which goes with your ideas about you know, anyone can really design the motorway system, or anyone yeah. can tell you how the health service should be done. Right? And one of the interesting things about the health service is the complete lack of proper design for mm. any feedback mm. mechanism at all. Mm. So I remember 20 years ago when we were going through one of the many reorganizations, <coughs> you know, I, I, we met, I met with a bunch of American students and the, and the then head of somewhere up in Bradford, uh, Health and I, you know, they read all these plans. And I said, "So, how are you going to know whether you meet your objectives?" And absolutely zero, apart from management speed. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's one of the key areas, and it requires a lot of psychological work to determine prosperity in this kind of way. Absolutely. Can I just add something to that, which is that w one of the interesting things, and it goes back to I'll speak to the Oedipal issue, which is that. Science has opened up and has much more than many other areas, which means that disagreements among scientists, um, disagreements among amongst experts, um, you know, is 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 more public. Um, I think that you know, in a sense, for those who don't necessarily take that to be precisely what the scientific method should be. Um, it is often read as, you know, not only does Mr. X think he knows more than I do, but actually he doesn't. Um, you know, which, which means that, you know, not only is deference not as, you know, is it not terribly effective or desirable, but actually it's just not going to happen because Mr. X has just been, over, been shown to be fallible and overtaken by Mr. Y for, for about six months. Now, I mean, this sounds like, you know, it sounds like Daily Mail speak, but it, it, but it is very, it, it, is, it is a deeply, deeply ingrained um, set of attitudes with, you know, mem with, with, with many, many, uh, with many citizens um, who, who aren't necessarily um, daily mail readers. <laughs> Well, I'm a natural optimist, so I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I do think there are. I think that, um, you know, on the one hand, we need, um, as, as David alluded to in a lot of the work that we do, we need uh, much more fine-grained reading of what uh, people's preferences are, what people's motivations might be. And that is about, it's not just about feedback, it, it, but it, it is about learning how, learning how to read, um, you know, a 
a set of behaviors and a complex set of preferences. But at the same time, as you say, that's not enough. There needs to be creativity. There needs to be creative destruction. Um, you know, and I think that you know, there's first of all, a crisis creates the opportunity for that. And certainly, the people that um, that we've been working with, for example, in in Copenhagen and. Um, we actually, um, our office, uh, counterpoint office in Paris, uh, is in a place called Super Public, uh, which is an innovation lab, and that really is about at the same time, you know, starting from a very different, you know, set of premises, starting with exploration, starting with uh, with creativity, securing the knowledge that we have enough of a. Of a, of a reading that we know that there may be some appetite for some of for some of these developments and I think that I mean to some extent the UK didn't do so badly in terms of innovation labs I mean even within government I remember a time when you know there was a, a an innovation unit inside the department for um, whatever it was called at the time children in schools um, and um, and so you know so successful were they that they actually became an independent innovation lab and um, I think there's a lot an awful lot less of it now I think many people um, I think many feel that they found the holy grail with a nudge unit um, which I think isn't terribly good news um, so I think there's less appetite for exploration under the guise of there being less money but that's an excuse, uh, I think. But yes, I think that those are very, very hopeful places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you see any dangers of co-design uh, institutions? Because uh, my fear is, you know, that as opposed to the kind of bureaucratic modern states. <coughs> Um, the new flexible institutions might be more sensitive to values and needs of some groups and less sensitive to values and needs of other groups. And then here I could relate, for example, to, to, uh, to the localism agenda mm -hmm. and to, um, to, to the localism act, whereby local communities are, are given right to plan their neighborhoods, to mm. secure money from in for investment and so on. And the research on this so far has proved that those communities who actually do plan their neighborhoods mm. are these communities who were very much involved in the planning process before. Uh, they are, uh, and they are, they, they are communities very much linked to, um, to, to, to business people. Mm -hmm. so, so my first question would be about about the the safeguard safeguarding of equality within the Absolutely. within the new flexible uh, within the new flexible settings because bureaucratic states did it they did secure public yeah. interest better or worse but they somehow they they did how how would new institutions do that and my second question would relate um, again to the to the relation between the central state and the um, and the, the local state these flexible arrangements might be plates between different might be this means these the, the, the kind of new flexibilities yeah. may be used by some institutions mm. to degrade the power of, mm -hmm. of others and, and here sure. again the, 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 the conservative That's government That's yeah great. That's yeah great. I see yeah. we're running out of time so Catherine give a good answer then we're okay <laughs> i'll try um I think that there's huge uh, dangers of co-designing, and one of the things we've seen in co-designing and co-production so far is that it works where there's already very high social capital, right? And where there's high, and often that social capital is correlated to class, is correlated to business presences, and so on and so forth. So, um, I think that you know there's a danger of promoting what is you know of low-hanging fruit and leaving the rest behind. That's that's one danger. The second danger, as you say, um, is you know, and that relates to the equality, uh, the equality issue. But also, I think that one of the things about you know co-designing a set of institutions, I always go back to an experiment that I thought was highly successful, which is an experiment that took place in Quebec when they had the same kind of breakdown of um, you know civic consideration and uh, and and rule of law between uh, several religious groups and and so on, and they. They created a commission called the Bouchard Taylor Commission, which was really all about um, redesigning, not in, re, 
redesigning the social contract for a new approval. So I think that this is one of the things that is interesting here. It's not that you just go and redesign institutions. It's actually you, you produce a set of possible alternatives, you know, and then you submit these to methods that still remain actually tried and, and, and tested. And maybe you experiment with the way in which they become legitimate and the way that they become acknowledged and adopted. But actually, you need to produce a set of options. You, you, that, I think, is really the key in terms of making sure that it doesn't get captured by interests. Um, yeah, I, sorry. <laughs> there are people at the door. So thank you very much, Catherine. And Pleasure. Uh, that's really fascinating. It clearly you do a lot of discussion around these issues. And thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.